Chapter 17 Some Solutions Monday was gray, rainy day, depressing. So was the stock market, which fell another six points. Turtle was jittery. All the airs were jittery. The bomb squad was called in several times to examine the suspicious parcels. One turned out to be a sealed vacuum cleaner bag full of dust that Crow had set behind the incinerator door. Another was a box delivered to Mrs. Wexler. In it were bonbons, her favorite, and a note, love and kisses, Jake. What do you mean, how come? Can't I send candy to my wife without getting the third degree? I thought you were looking on the thin side, okay? Grace made him eat the first piece. The next day, Grace received a larger box. In it, the bomb squad found a dozen long-stemmed roses and a note. For no reason at all, just love, Jake. The bomb squad was called in again when Turtle ran after her partner through the lobby shouting, Mrs. Baumback! Mrs. Baumback! Someone thought she had shouted, Bomb! Bomb! A hollow wind wailed through the damp Tuesday. In the morning, the stock market rose three points. Bullish, said Flora Baumbach. In the afternoon, the market dropped five points. Bearish, said Flora Baumbach. Those were the only two trading terms she had learned. Madame Hu, a quicker student than the dressmaker, had learned more words. Partner, money, house, tree, road, pots, pans, okay, football, good, rain, spare ribs. Her teacher, Jake Wexler visited her in the kitchen before he sat down to his daily lunch in the Chinese restaurant. Today, his wife and Jimmy Hu agreed to eat with their only customer on the promise that he would keep them with their clues and not take a share of the inheritance if they won. Grace laid their five words on the table. These are clues? Jake looked down on purple waves for fruited sea. He switched two squares of Westing super strength towels. Purple fruited makes more sense. How about grapes or plums? Grace was about to insist on purple waves, but plums reminded her of something. Plum? She said aloud. Plum! Wasn't that the lawyer's name? Plum? You're right, Grace. Mr. Who said excitedly, you're absolutely right. He tore one of the clues in two. Fruited, Ed, purple fruit, Ed Plum. We got it, we got it, Grace cried, leaping up to embrace her partner. I never did trust lawyers, Mr. Who shouted gleefully. What about the other clues for sea waves, Jake asked. But the happy, hugging, and dancing celebrated pair did not hear him. Boom! said Madame Who, placing a plate of spare ribs on the table. The words she had learned from Otis Amber. Sandy was proud of the notebook he bought. With its glossy cover, photograph of a bald eagle in flight, sort of appropriate, he explained to the judge, fits in with Uncle Sam and all that. In it, he painstakingly entered the information culled from the reports of the private detective delivered each day to the judge Ford's office. Photostats of birth certificates, death notices, marriage licenses, driver's licenses, vehicular accident reports, criminal records, hospital records, school records. To these, the doorman added the results of his own snooping. My investigator is having a difficult time getting into the not-so-public records of Westingtown, the judge said. We'll have to put it to the Westings aside and begin with the heirs. Since we're feasting on chicken with water chestnuts, Sandy said, I'll start off with the Who's. Doug had delivered down. He read aloud from his entry. <coughs> Who? James Shin Hu, born James Hu in Chicago, age 50, added Shin to his name when he went into the restaurant business because it sounded more Chinese. First wife died of cancer five years ago. Married again last year. Has one son, Douglas. Son Lin Hu, age 28, born in China, immigrated from Hong Kong two years ago. Gossip. 
James who married her for her hundred-year-old sauce. Douglas who, called Doug, age 18, high school track star, is competing in Saturday's track meet against college milers. Westing Connection, who sued Sam Westing over the invention of the disposable paper diaper. Case never came to court. Westing disappeared. Settled with the company last year for $25,000. Thinks his, he was cheated. Latest invention, paper inner soles. I can take some of the credit for those paper inner soles, Sandy bragged. My feet were killing me standing at the door all day, so I told Jimmy, Jimmy, if only somebody would invent a good inner sole that didn't take up too much room in those foam rubber things. And sure enough, he did. They're great. I got a pair in my shoes now, wanna see? No, thank you. The judge was eating. It was past midnight when Theo finished his homework in the dim light of the study lamp. The wind was still howling, and something, a word, a phrase, was still eluding him. He had been studying solutions in chemistry. Solutions! That was it! The solution is simple, the will said. He was sure of it. By changing four and the to numbers four and three, Theo was able to arrange the clues into a formula. Whether or not it was a chemical solution, let alone the Westing solution, was another matter. N. He is four no the two equals NH four NO three. But four clue letters were left out. It's so O sit it's so Otist. Otis He had it a formula for an explosive and the name of the murderer. He had to tell Doug Where going Theo smoothed the blanket over his sleepy brother in the next bed, struggled into his bathrobe, and stumbled over the wheelchair as he tipped out of the room. The elevator made too much noise, used the stairs. The cement was cold, he had forgotten his slippers. Two unmarked doors. Which one? Tap, tap, tap. A grunting voice, dragging footsteps. Please let it be Doug. Please let it be Doug, not Mr. Who or Judge Ford. It was Crow. Clutching at the robe about her gaunt frame, her unknotted hair hung long and limp. She tried to focus her dulled eyes on the shocked face of the visitor. Theo! Theo! The wind! I heard the wind! I knew you would come! Me? Grasping his hand, she pulled him into the maid's apartment between 4C and 4D and shut the door. We are sinners, yet shall be saved. Let us pray for deliverance. Then you must go to your angel. Take her away. Theo found himself kneeling on the bare floor next to a praying crow. He must be dreaming. Amen. Chapter 18. The Trackers It was Flora Baumbach who braided Turtle's hair now. Sometimes in three strands, sometimes four. Sometimes twined with ribbons while Turtle read the Wall Street Journal. Listen to this. The newly elected chairman of the board of Westing Paper Products Corporation, Julian R. Eastman, announced from London where he is conferring with European management that earnings from all divisions are expected to double in the next quarter. That's nice, Flora Baumbach said, not understanding a word of it. Turtle gave the order for the day. Listen carefully. As soon as you get to the broker's office, I want you to sell AMO, sell SEA, sell MT, and put all the money into WPP, okay? Oh my, that meant selling every stock mentioned in their clues and buying more shares of Westing Paper products at a loss of some thousand dollars. Whatever you say, Alice, you're the smart one. Flora Baumbach's hands were gentle. They never hurried or pulled a stray hair. Flora Baumbach loved her. She could tell. I like it when you call me Alice, Turtle said, but I better not call you Mrs. Baumbach anymore because of the bomb scare, you know. Calling her Flora would spoil everything. Maybe I could call you Mrs. Baba. Why not just Baba? That's exactly what Turtle, Alice, wanted to hear. Was your daughter, Rosalie, very smart, Baba? 
My, no. You're the smartest child I ever met. A real businesswoman. Turtle glowed behind the Wall Street Journal. I bet Rosalie baked bread and patched quilts and dumb stuff like that. The dressmaker's sure fingers fumbled over the red ribbons she was weaving into a four-strand braid. Rosalie was an exceptional child. The friendliest, lovingest. Turtle crumpled the newspaper. Let's go. I'm late for school and you've got that big trade to make. But I haven't finished tying the ribbons. Never mind. I like them hanging. Turtle felt like kicking somebody. Anybody. Good and hard. Sandy was not at the door when they left. He was in apartment 4D, neatly writing in his patriotic notebook information gathered on the next air. Baumbach. Flora Baumbach. Maiden name, Flora Miller. Age 60. Dressmaker. Husband left her years ago. Sends no money. She had a retarded daughter, Rosalie, a mongoloid child. Sold bridal shop last year after Rosalie died of pneumonia. Age 19. Spends most of her time at the stockbrokers. Westing Connection. Made a wedding gown for Violet Westing, which she never got to wear. Sandy turned to a fresh page, propped his feet on the judge's desk, and began to read the data supplied by a private investigator on Otis Amber. He laughed so hard, he nearly fell off the tilting chair. Haunted by last night's dream, Theo jog jogged behind his partner halfway to this high school before he uttered a breathless, STOP! Doug Who stopped. Who lives in the apartment next to yours? Crow, why? Nothing. How come he didn't know that? Because no one ever wonders where the cleaning woman lives, that's why. But he wasn't like that, was he? Still, it must have been a dream. In the dream, the nightmare, Crow had given him a letter, but the only thing he found in his bathrobe pocket this morning was a Westing paper hanky. Hey, wait! Doug had started off again. I figured out our clues. Ammonium nitrate. It's used in fertilizers, explosives, and rocket propellants. I knew those clues were a pile of fertilizer, Doug replied, jogging easily. Only one thing mattered. Saturday's big track meet. If he won or came in fast second, he'd have his pick of athletic scholarships. He didn't need the inheritance. Stand still and listen! Theo grabbed Doug by the shoulders and held him flat-footed on the ground. Like it or not, we're partners and you've got to do your share. Sure, Doug replied. His father was angry, his partner was angry, and the bomber was blowing up Sunset Towers floor by floor. Some game. What do you want me to do? Follow Otis Amber. Head tilted back, Flora Baumbach squint, squirted drops in her eyes, blinked, and stared again at the moving tape. HR, a thousand, forty-two dollars and a half, WPP, five thousand, thirty-nine and a quarter, BRY, twenty-seven, T-A, five and seventeen and a quarter, Z, five thousand, twenty-seven and a quarter, W-P-P, five thousand, thirty-nine and a half. Oh, my! Westing Paper Products had jumped four and a quarter. No, four and a half points. Her eyes must be blurry from the medicine. The dressmaker sat on the edge of her chair, biting her fingernails waiting for WPP to cross the board again. There! WPP! Forty dollars! Oh my, oh my! This morning she had paid thirty-five dollars a share. There it goes again! WPP! Forty dollars and a quarter! Oh my, oh my, oh my! After classes, instead of running around the indoor track, Doug Who jogged out of the gym to the shopping center six blocks away. There was Otis Amber placing two cake boxes in the compartment of his bike. He picked up a package from the butcher shop and pedaled off. 
unaware of the sweat-suited figure trotting half a block behind him and wet into sunset towers to make his deliveries hi dog gonna run the mile under four minutes on saturday the doorman asked sure hope so do me a favor sandy give a loud whistle when otis amber comes out okay chip tooth sandy gave such a loud whistle that otis amber would have been deafened if the flaps of the aviator's helmet had not been snug against his ears leaving his bicycle in the parking lot otis amber boarded a bus doug ran up the five uphill miles to a house with the placard e j plum attorney he ran another three uphill miles after the bus that took the delivery boy to the hospital entrance doug sank down in the waiting room chair wiped his face on his sweatshirt and picked up a magazine fascinated by the centerfold picture he almost missed otis amber who dashed out of the hospital as though fleeing for his life hiding behind parked cars doug followed the delivery boy to another bus ran four steep miles to a stockbroker's office how is it that all the roads go uphill from the broker to the high school from the high school downhill at last back to sunset towers the exhausted track star leaned against the side of the building thankful he was not a long distance runner i gotcha otis amber poked a skinny finger into doug's ribs he 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 cackled handing the startled runner a letter it's from the lawyer plum says all the heirs gotta be at westinghouse this saturday night sign here with his last ounce of energy he wrote doug who miler on the receipt and then slid down the wall to a weary squat some miler his feet were blistered his muscles sore and he could barely breathe he might never run another step in his life On receiving the notice of the Westinghouse meeting, Judge Ford canceled her remaining appointments and hurried home. Time was running out. Sandy read from her, read to her from his notebook. Amber. Otis Joseph Amber, age 62. Delivery boy, fourth grade dropout, IQ 50. Lives in the basement of Green's Grocery. A bachelor, no living relatives. Westing Connection delivered letters from E.J. Plum, attorney, both times. I would have get I would have guessed Otis had an IQ of minus ten. Sandy said with a smile. Go on to the next heir. The judge replied. Dear, D. Denton Dear, age twenty five, graduate of U.W. Medical School, first year intern, plastic surgery. Parents live in Racine. No heirs. Westing Connection, engaged to Angela Wexler, see Wexler's, who looks like Sam Westing's daughter, Violet, who also engaged to be married, but to a politician, not an intern. That's awful complicated, I know, the doorman apologized, but it's the best I could do. Pulaski. Sedell Pulaski, age 50, education, high school, one year secretarial school secretary to the president of short sausages it takes her first vacation in 25 years six months saved up time lived with widowed mother and two aunts until she moved to sunset towers walked with a crutch even before she broke her ankle the second bombing now needs two crutches she paints them westing connection unknown we don't have any medical reports on her muscular ailment, Sandy reported. The nurse at Schultz Sausages said she was in perfect health when she left on vacation. Strange, the judge remarked, a suspicious melody, no apparent Western connection. Somehow, Sadell Pulaski did not seem to fit in. Sadell Pulaski clasped the translated notes to her bosom. My little secret mustn't peek, she said coyly, but the doctor has had come to see Angela. The plastic surgeon loosened the tape from her cheek and peered under the gauze. One graft should do it, but we can't operate until the tissue heals, he said to the intern, then spoke to the patient. Call my secretary for an appointment in two months. 
He strode out of the room, leaving Denton Deer to replace the bandage. I don't want plastic surgery, Angela mumbled. It still hurt to talk. Nothing to be frightened of. He's the best when it comes to facial repairs. That's why I brought him in. We'll have to postpone the wedding. We can have a small informal wedding. Mother wouldn't like that. How about you, Angela? What do you want? He knew her own spoken answer was, I don't know. The door flew open and slammed against the adjacent wall. Where do you think you're going? Denton pulled Turtle to a halt by one of the streaming ribbons twisted in her braid. The sign says no visitors. I'm not a visitor, I'm her sister. And get your germy hands off my hair. Denton Deer hurried to seek first aid for his bleeding shin and sent the biggest male nurse on the floor to take care of Turtle. The same male nurse who chased Otis Amber out of the hospital for sneaking up on a nurse's aide carrying a specimen tray and shouting, BOOM! Turtle had time for one question. Angela, what did you sign on the receipt this time after position? Person? I changed mine to victim, Sadell said. Turtle paid no attention to the victim. She was more interested in the two men entering the room, a burly male nurse, and that creep of a lawyer, Plum. I gotta go. Don't say anything to anybody about anything, Angela. No matter what happens, not even to a lawyer. You know nothing, you hear? Nothing! She skirted Ed Plum, ducked under the outstretched hairy hands of the male nurse, slid down the hall, scampered down the stairs, and out of the hospital. Hi, how are you? Ed Plum smiled at Angela, ignoring the patient in the other bed. He didn't recognize Miss Pulaski without her painted crutch. I'm sorry to hear about your accident. Otis Amber told me about it. I just thought I'd drop in for a chat. The young lawyer, who admired the pretty heiress from the minute he had first laid eyes on her, did not have a chance to chat. Grace Wexler entered the room and saw the answer to the clues. Ed Purple Fruit, the murderer, standing over her daughter, and uttered a blood-curdling shriek. Three visitors in one day! The first was Otis Amber with a letter, another a receipt to sign. Chris had pretended to be scared by the boom, but he wasn't really. He had twitched because he was excited about going to the Westinghouse again, even if he hadn't figured out the clues. Then Flora Baumbach came to see him. He wasn't nervous at all with that nice lady. She smiles that funny smile because she's sad inside. She once had a daughter named Rosalie. She told him how Rosalie would sit in the shop and say hello to the customers and how she would feel the fabrics. Mrs. Baumbach made wedding dresses, which are mostly white, so she brought samples of materials with bright colors and patterns because Rosalie loved colors best. Rosalie had 573 different swatches in her collection before she died. Mrs. Baumbach said her daughter might have been an artist if things had turned out differently. What would I have been if things had turned out differently? The third visitor entered. Limping! His partner was limping! Too much excitement. His stupid body was jerking all over the place. Denton Deer sat down next to the wheelchair. Take it easy, Chris. Calm down, kid. I'm not the creature from the Black Lagoon, you know. His partner, a doctor, watched horror movies on television, too. Slowly, arms untangled, legs unsnarled. Slowly, Chris stuttered out of his news. Flora Baumbach felt so guilty about seeing their dropped clue that she told him one of hers. Mountain. But we mustn't tell Turtle. Don't worry, the intern said, displaying a bruised shin. Chris laughed and then stopped. i sorry. Mountain. Hmm. Then Deer thought about the new clue. If a treasure is hidden in a grain shed on a mountain plain... I'm sure I don't have time to look for it, do you? Hmm. Let's forget the clues. I have something more important to tell you. Don't get excited, okay? Chris nodded. His partner was going to ask for the money. Denton Deer stood. I'll get your toothbrush and pajamas and we'll go to the hospital. Don't get excited. 
Chris got excited. How could he explain that he wanted more from his partner was companionship, not more probing, pricking doctors with their bad news that made his mother cry? Listen, Chris, can you hear me? Just overnight, I found a neurologist, a nerve doctor, who works on problems like yours. Operation? No operation. Did you hear me, Chris? No operation. The doctor thinks a new medicine may help, but he has to examine you, make some tests. I have your parents' permission, but no one will touch you unless we talk it over first. You and me, together, I promise. Chris Grimmins trying to smile. His partner said talk over the two of them together. They really were partners now. You can have money. What? Oh, the money? Later. All Here, let me take those. You won't need them in the hospital. Chris clung to his binoculars. Well, I guess you do need them. Ready? Here we go. All of a sudden, he was leaving Sunset Towers, pushed by his limping partner. Maybe Dr. Deer is not who and what he says he is. Maybe he is being kidnapped for ransom. Maybe he's being held hostage. Oh boy, he hasn't had so much fun in years.